Hi, everybody. My name is Eddie McDaniel, and this is a High Note Podcast. How you doing, Eddie? I'm good. Good, man. It's good to see you. Man, I'm glad glad to come up. Uh, it's uh it's January, so you've had a, a long season before. A long season. Uh, and now we're now we're back to where I can actually sit down, have a conversation with you and um uh and for everybody, uh I'm my, my name is Jesse Hill. This is the High Note Podcast. Uh Hank is not with us today and he might pop in later. We'll see. But if not, uh we miss you, Hank. I've grew up knowing Eddie, his name, everything that he's done. Um my dad was a big fan of yours, because uh, my dad was a local musician. And, and I was a big fan of his. I too. appreciate it, yeah. <laughs> and uh and so just getting to sit down with you and talk to you, I, was, I music wise, I really want to dive in your inspirations and where you got started. Uh was it a younger age, was it later in life? Um, and just give me your story of what got you into music. Well, I was born in San Diego, California. All my relatives lived in South Georgia, a little town called Manchester. And uh my dad was military. And he took my mom, and he took me and dropped us off at my grandmother's house, grandmother and grandfather. Well, you know, my mother decided that she um, she didn't want a two-year-old at that particular moment. <laughs> so she uh, she left, and she never came back. And uh, my grandmother raised me till I was uh, almost 13, Grandmother, grandfather. And then uh, my dad remarried. He's military. He married a Canadian Navy woman. And uh, he decided, well, you know, he had to have his son come live with him, you know. And I was almost, I was pretty much set in my ways at that particular moment. And uh, the whole time I was growing up under the bed, I'll never forget he had a Gibson 335 guitar under that bed, and I love that guitar. And he'd have killed me if he knew what I put that guitar through, you know, because I only seen him about every three or four years when he'd come home on leave. So I didn't know him. I didn't know him at all. And then one day he comes and says, well, I'm remarried now, and you're going to have to go with us, and we're going to California. So we went to Alameda, California, and it was the worst experience of my life. Absolutely the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. I fought every day because I had a Southern accent, and the kids called me Colonel Sanders. Mm. And right beside our apartment building was the school that I went to, and there was a 16-foot chain-link fence right outside my bedroom window. And to get to school so I wouldn't have to deal with them kids, I would climb that fence every morning to go into the schoolyard. I'd jump out my window, hang on to the fence, climb up over that 16-foot fence and down into the schoolyard where I knew I'd be safe. But it didn't take them long to figure that out, and then they started hanging around out there by my bedroom window waiting on me. But if, if I saw them out there, then I'd go around the front, you know. But there was a kid that that I knew there – that we didn't particularly like each other, but he played guitar. And I was so intrigued by that. I wanted to do that so bad. He only played like a couple of little riffs, you know, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to do that. So we moved to Washington State. I stayed up there. I don't know. I went to school up there four or five years. And then we moved to Mississippi. Well, Mississippi was like home to me. I mean, I I never realized why that I really liked Mississippi because I always told everybody I had no relatives here. But my great-great-grandfather's buried at Beauvoir. Ah. And uh, all my relatives live in North Mississippi uh, on the Trammell side. And uh, anyway, so I joined the Navy here. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of an intriguing story. My dad didn't know that I was in the Navy, and he was in the Navy, and he was in Vietnam. So I just got out of boot camp, and they put me, they stationed me in Gulfport. Wow. I was, I was right at home. Mm -hmm. I'm standing there at attention, and here comes my dad. My dad walks by. He turns around, and he comes back and goes, what in the world are you doing? I said, well, I'm in the Navy, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, 
he said, man, that's something. He said, uh, where well, are you going to be stationed? I said, I guess the 20th for now till I get my orders. Well, as it turned out, he was my boss in the Navy for three years. Wow. I cleaned every toilet the Navy mm. had. You know how that goes. You I know, he that. didn't want to show no favoritism. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I, uh, as time went on, I got out of the military. Just at the time that I got out of the military, while I was in the Navy, I had a guy named Dudley McFalls. And Dudley was a super picker. And Dudley needed somebody to play rhythm so he could play lead and practice. So he taught me how to play rhythm, you know, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, he taught me how to do that. And I learned very well how to do that. And so uh, first one thing led to another. And uh, then I started to accompany myself singing because I've always been a singer as long as I'd ever could remember. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so when I got out of the, when I got out of the, I was just getting ready to get out of the Navy. I had a, I had a band, you know, and, uh, we auditioned for that Wrangler star search. Okay. It was called Wrangler ACE hardware country star search, 1979, 1980. One of the first ones that, that they had. Well, I won all the locals. It was about four or five of them. And then I won the regional and then I won the state. And then we come back and placed in the national. Didn't win, but we placed. And uh, it was like third place or something like hey, that. Hey, man, that's still pretty dang good. <laughs> but I got to go to Disney World, and I stayed down there. I stayed down there a couple of years and uh, just played music. And then I came back and started buying nightclubs. No, you, you said you played at Disney World. What part of Disney World? Just in the... In the was it like the uh, park itself, it was, or was it? They have, they have little afternoon bars. Okay, yeah, yeah. And it was like Backwater Bay. Gotcha. And, you know, I'm just up there doing Jimmy Buffett tunes and stuff like that, you know. Gotcha. And that really that really started my my music career, so to speak. And uh, you know, knowing those chords and knowing the songs. Mm -hmm. But how I how I learned all those songs was uh when I the day I got out of the Navy, I went down to Stevens Hot Groceries to have a getting out of the Navy party with my friends. And uh Steve Stevens was in there, and uh, George Mills was playing. I love George. I've been friends with George for 50 years. But uh, George was playing, and we were all sitting back there in the back room, and one of the guys got to laughing because every song that George sang, when he would sing, it sounded like the Cowardly Lion on The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> he did that at the end of everything he did. <laughs> you know? So we got to laughing about it. <laughs> so, uh, oh gosh. So, uh, that's not to take anything away from George because George is, is a wonderful, wonderful, he's a phenomenal musician and I love him dearly. But, uh, we got finished and, uh, he got, he was taking a break and George came back there because we were like the only ones in the building, you know, there was like six or eight of us. And George, he'd come back there to see what was going on while we were laughing and cutting up like that. You know, he wanted to be part of it. And one of the guys said, man, you need to let this guy sing. I said, you got to be crazy. You only know <laughs> three songs, you know. This was before I really got started playing. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, no. Uh, George said, yeah, man, come on. If you play, come on. He said, because I get paid either way. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter to me. He said, use my guitar. So I went up there and I played the three songs that I knew. And, uh, of course my guys were, yeah, you mm -hmm. know, they were, they were you know, lapping it up, you know? So when I finished Steve Stevens come back there and he said, man, you want a job? I'm thinking, well, I'm getting out of the Navy. I'm fixing to draw $235 unemployment. I said, what you got, I can do. He said, play music. <laughs> I said, play music. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He said, no, I'm serious. He said, I, I like what you do. I said, I don't know any songs. He said, well, we got a jukebox. He said, you got a tape recorder? I said, yeah. He said, well, come on down and record some songs off the jukebox and, and learn them. So I thought, I said, how much you pay me? He said, I pay you $50 a night. I said, that's another $100. Friday and Saturday? He said, yeah. I said, that's another 100 on top of what I'd be making. So I got one of Bell and Howell, and flat little cassette recorders. Mm-hmm. And a pocket full of quarters, and I went down there on Sunday morning. He made, yeah. And I recorded every song off that jukebox I thought I could learn. Wow. So I went home and took my typewriter. That was back during typewriter days for computers. And uh, I started with Bob Seger, Against the Wind. 
because that was in the B's and that was mm-hmm. the first song. And I, I typed the words. And what I would do is if, if the word held out, I would put little lines underneath it, you know, to, to hold it out like, uh, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I'd go back with a pencil and I would make my own music notes because I didn't read music, but I understood what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And then I would go back and I would learn the chords. And then by the weekend, I had 30 songs. And I knew them all because I had rehearsed them over and over and over and over and over. I had played them so much and I knew them, you know. So I went back down there that weekend and I was playing. Well, here comes a guy that uh, sets in and wants to play wants to play a guitar with me. His name's Arnold Graham. So Arnold came down there. Arnold wouldn't face the crowd. He'd stand there with his back to the crowd, mm-hmm. and, and he'd play his guitar with me, you know. So I stayed there like that, I don't know, a couple of weekends. Another guy showed up named Pat Skidowski. And Pat sang harmony and played lead, acoustic lead. So it was Eddie and Pat for, I don't know, six, eight months. I stayed there. And then I had a chance to go to Texas. I, I took a friend of mine to Texas, and uh, I was at a club one night, and I saw a guy playing guitar and kicking bass pedals with a drum machine. Oh, I had to have that. So I got with him, and we became friends, and and he showed me what he was doing. And I, so I was in the music store one day, and a brand just had come out of the box, a brand new set of mini pedals, bass pedals. Ah. Okay. Was this and what year was this? Was this like when MIDI was kind of emerging? When MIDI first came out. Gotcha. And I didn't know what the pedals did at that time, but they made a boom, 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 boom. So I'd hit a C and I'd go ding, 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 you know, <laughs> on my guitar, you know, until I pretty soon it took me about two or three weeks, but I was kicking both feet and I'd get a bar stool just high enough my feet could touch the pedals had a drum machine, so I went back on all my songs, and I wrote the tempo down from the drum machine. So that way, when I go to Bob Seger Against the Wind, I know it was tempo 95, mm-hmm. and it was this this one, this country beat, one, two, three, and I'd hit the start pedal on the, on the uh, drum machine, and then I'd hit the first bass note, G, on the Against the Wind, and I'd, here I went, man, and, and I did that for a long time. And then I started experimenting. I started, uh, oh, right about that time, I was either going to go back in the Navy or the star search thing. So I decided not to go back in the Navy. I decided to go ahead and pursue my music thing, which music has made me a good living for a long, long time. And and when I went to Disney World, since I was playing by myself, I got used to playing with bass guitar and drums on tracks. So that's when I left, when I left down there, that's what I continued to use. I didn't have to kick pedals anymore because the bass was already on the, on the track. And that, and, and I had all kinds of machines. I had players and I had, I had iPods and I had iPads and when they first came out, you mm-hmm. know, I was playing with everything until the laptop came out and I integrated it all into the laptop. And that's what I still do today. I still do the laptop. And then Katrina came. Katrina wiped me out. And uh, I had a friend of mine that gave me a hard drive. Wallace Baker. I'll never forget him. He uh, he came to my house one day and he said, I understand you, you've you lost everything. I said, yeah, pretty much did. I had uh, seven foot of water in my house on the beach down there. Oh, wow. Yep. What part of the beach? Where, where were you at? I live right there uh were uh, Southern Circle, Mockingbird Lane. Gotcha, gotcha. And uh, I, I was second house up. I was 800 feet from 90. So uh, the water just came up, and uh, it uh, it it got everything, even stuff that I had. I put all my guitars and everything up on the second floor, so I never got water to the second floor, but it, it destroyed everything on the first floor. And all my equipment was in my van. Yeah, and my van actually lifted up and moved up over all kind of stuff. So I had to jack the van up, get stuff out from underneath, get my van out. You know, my both my children were born. Uh, 
one, see, Samantha's 41, and Jennifer is uh, 38. And she, uh, both of them birthdays in December. So about 1985, I guess it was, we'd have big parties there because I lived there on the beach. And we're in the mall at that time was the only thing place to go. The wife said, you know, you don't dress up like Santa Claus. You know, you got a beard. And we'll spray paint it white, you know. You got a beard. And and you can give the kids their goodie bags, you know, and add, maybe ask them what they want for Christmas, stuff like that. So that's what I did. And now I'm doing their children's children's children. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how long I've been doing it. But my wife worked at the Beau Rivage, and she's in a meeting one day. And uh, this was right after the bow was built. They said they were going to do a Christmas in July. So I had I, I wanted to do the best I could. Anytime I do anything, I want to do the best that I can. So I had a suit made like I thought I would really like and other people would like to see. She sent me to the bow to meet that guy. And the guy said, yeah, you'll do. You're fine. You know, I like your suit and everything. I want to, uh, you're not going to take very many pictures because these are all older people and they're not going to care that much about Santa Claus. We took 1,800 pictures. <laughs> After that, I was I was in with the bow. Yeah. And uh, I've been there 22 years. Wow. As Santa and, Claus. And you, you do it right too. Like, you know, the Gulf Coast – I mean, I don't know if you know this. I'm sure I mean, everybody that listens is going to agree with me. You have become like the official Santa Claus of, in my opinion, the Gulf South region. Like nobody touches. I mean, and you went that extra mile with a custom-made costume and, uh, you know, everything that you do. And then I've seen you actually, I've had the privilege to see you go to do different private house parties. And it's not like you just sit there and take pictures with kids. You sit there, you you read to them. Oh, they're you, my audience. Yeah, you <laughs> sing to them because... They're your audience, and then the the parents are the audience of their children enjoying That's the, the magic of Christmas. So, uh, when I leave a house, my phone starts ringing. When can I get you? Next, oh yeah, year, year after next. Yeah, because I'm already booked next year. Well, I know I know my sister. She every time she's she you have to book, you yeah. know, a, a year maybe even two in advance. Like yeah. I was looking at your schedule this past December, and you were showing me your your. Your, I call them gigs, but you're, I, I, do you right. still call them gigs? If yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. I looked at your gigs, uh, and you were almost full, and I was like, wow, that's yeah. a, that's a good problem to have. It's a good problem. And every time I see a baby, I think, ah, uh, <laughs> you know, job security. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, uh, that's funny. That's funny. Um, now music wise, uh, who would you say, I always ask people like, who's your inspiration? A lot of people say the Beatles, Beach Boys, uh, Eric Clapton was my Eric inspiration. Clapton's. BB King. Mm hmm. I really, I really like the BB King stuff, even though I don't play a whole lot of it. My influence on my, on my guitar playing, it comes from BB. Did you ever see him live? I did. As a matter of fact, I booked him when I was working at Treasure Bay. Oh wow! I booked him for the Blues Fest. I booked him. I booked Kenny Wayne Shepherd on his 18th birthday. Oh gosh! So that's how long ago that was, because he's—I don't think he's about 30 now. And that's the ship. That's the Treasure Bay ship days. That's ship days. That's right. Uh, yep. Before my time, I always every I was a kid, and every time we drive by, I was like, "Oh, look at the pirate ship!" Uh huh. But yep. it was, it was well, gone for. I, could even I went step to foot. Treasure Bay before that pirate ship was ever moved over. Wow. And I did I did some things on the ship for the bar that I had to trade beer for to get them to do it because <laughs> they wouldn't pay for it. Yeah. Uh, one of them was I found out where the sound booth was going to be, and I, I asked them to drill a hole out of the sound booth for an audio cable. Mm. Well, they didn't want to do it. So I gave one of the guys, one of the workers, a case of beer, and he drilled me a hole. And then he drilled one up behind the stage. And they couldn't figure out what I wanted that for. Well, the first night we opened, the guy in a wheelchair came over with his chair, and he dumped. It, he tried to go over the go over the cable mm -hmm. that was laying on the floor, and he almost fell out of his chair. Well, the next morning they called me, won't know how they gonna hide that cable. No problem. I already got it. I already got it fixed. Yeah. The, the, you know, half a day later, we had an audio cable run out of the floor. That's awesome. Because I'd had the foresight to, to see that, you know, uh, doing that my whole life. Yeah. And, uh, it worked, it worked phenomenally after that. I mean, it was, uh, it was a good thing. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed Treasure Bay. 
You know, my uh, my great uncle actually built that building. Uh, the Sher- it used to be the Sheridan, and his name was F. R. Kimbrough. There used to be a big painting, and my dad always told Roll me that. Roll Yeah, and uh, and it so, was a Sheridan, I think. Maybe that's what it was. It was it, whatever it was. He he built it because he had um, commercial building. That's what he did. That's Jackson. pretty cool. That's and so every time I pass there, I'm like, oh, you know. But I, didn't, I never got to meet him. It was pa- way past my time, or way before my time, sorry. So you worked at Treasure Bay, and then when did you, when were you, what year would you say you were a full-time musician? And this is all you do. After Katrina. After Katrina? Yeah, after Katrina, I decided I wasn't going to go back to them cutthroat casinos. Because when you have a job at a casino, everybody wants it. <laughs> you got a job like entertainment director. It's the endless supply of people coming in wanting to take your job. Yeah. And let me tell you, I lost my job at Treasure Bay because of a guy named David. So David calls my boss and he says, look, he said, if you'll pay me the same thing that you're paying Eddie, I have a degree in marketing. I'll come over and I will be your marketing director. Plus I'll hire entertainment. That'll save you that much money. Okay. So they said, okay, we'll do that. So, Monday and Tuesday are my days off, okay, at Treasure Bay. So I'm on the Glen, what's that boat, that sailboat? The seal, uh, uh, what's the name of that that sailboat right there at the Biloxi Yacht Club? Oh, the schooner, isn't it? Schooner. Okay, yeah, schooner. Yeah, I'm on the schooner, and I'm fixing to play music. I'm fixing to hit the first note, and my phone rings. I look, it's my boss at Treasure Bay. Barbara says, you didn't show up for the marketing meeting this morning. I said, there was no marketing meeting. She said, yeah, we called an emergency marketing meeting. I said, what did y'all discuss? She said, well, it's not, it's, it's not nothing you're concerned about now. You're not a team player, so we're going to let you go. Wow. I didn't know about David. I didn't know anything about it. He had come down there and made the offer. So they get on the phone after she fires me. She calls David. She says, okay, you got the job. He immediately gets on the phone, calls his boss, and said, they're going to give me this much money to move me over to Treasure Bay. Do you want to match it? And they said, yeah, we'll match it. We'll keep you. Well, he's leveraging each other. So he was leveraging. I lost my job, and he stays where he was. And to this day, to this day, he won't hire me to play music over there. He will not. He won't have nothing to do with me. Mm, man. I, and I hate to hear stuff, and it happens all the time. I hate to hear that particular story because you're, I know you and you're a great guy. And uh, I just know the casinos. My dad got laid off in Boulder Box three times because of it was 9 11, and then I believe Katrina, and then 08 hit. So it was, and it, it was never fired. He was just laid off because they see it, they see it as a number, and it's somebody from Vegas saying, "Hey, we got to you know let this person let, let this position go." And I was it, it's cutthroat, and it's sometimes you know. I hate to I hate to see people go through, you know, that kind of thing. Well, they so, take care of me at the boat. Of yeah, course, oh, but well, what I'm, what I'm saying, they take care of me at Pearl. So it's not all casinos. But what we're saying is, th- that's after Katrina and that happened. I mean, you're now full time musician. You're just like, you know what? I'm I'm clocking out and I'm going to work for myself. And are you glad that you went that route? Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. But I, you know, over the period of years, I've learned so many thousands of songs that I can play a '50s and '60s week, a '70s and '80s week, you know, a, a country week, <laughs> you know, not day or hour, but week, yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and uh, just in my experience, just traveling around, I was at Pigeon Forge for a couple of years, uh, playing up in Gatlinburg, you know. Uh, See, you're you're naming places that I literally love going to, like Disney World. Love going to Disney World, Pigeon Forge, uh, Titanium Museum, all those places. Well, I played in Silver Dollar City, and I was laid off when Dolly bought it. Gotcha. It was the end of the season. I was packing up, had all my stuff in my camper, went out there. Dolly was out there with a the golden shovel digging, you know. So I got to see her. And you know, I will tell you something. I have never seen. I've seen a lot of stars because I've been on. I've been on. Grand Ole Opry a couple of times. Wow. Yeah. So I, if you, I haven't even heard of that. We're going to have to get to that, but go ahead. Well, that was, that was uh, for the Star Search. Gotcha. So we got to go, we got to perform on the Grand Ole Opry for the Star Search. And then I went back for You Can Be a Star. And I won three weeks on You Can Be a Star. And then there was a new band that's coming out. And uh, I think it was all planned, but it was okay because the guy that beat me, I respect. 
guy that beat me this, the last week, Sawyer Brown. Wow. Uh-huh. I'd won all the all the weeks except the last one. And so I had maybe five songs that I'd written. He had a portfolio that thick of songs that he had written. And you've heard a lot of those songs. I bet I have. Yes, you have. You know, he had more number ones than Garth Brooks. He sure did. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, he did. And uh, so I, I wouldn't, you know, I felt like I was in good company losing, you know. Yeah. If you're going to lose somebody, I mean. Might as well lose somebody like that. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I didn't, I didn't mind. And, uh, but that was, every time I ever went to Nashville, I was invited. And then, you know, believe it or not, the star search, the star search thing, I tried to get video. I tried to get information about it. But, you know, the the people that, that did the star search thing, they lost they lost the building, all the audio, video. They lost everything, either the fire or flood. I don't remember. Back in the mid-'80s, they had that big flood and lost everything. Wow. And so there's no information about any of that. Mm. The only thing, the way I could prove that I was ever there is I have a ticket stub that my pawn-in-law bought <laughs> to get in the building. <laughs> and it's not online anywhere. I can't find anything about it. I I had about that much in the newspaper when I won the state. It said local winner Eddie McDaniel wins state competition for Wrangler Star Search. That was it. It was just a little bitty space. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you're when you're talking about playing at those, how hard is it to get uh, like a regular gig at one of those parks? You know, is is it something that you walk up to and say, "Hey, I can sing," or do they find you? Or how does it's, that work? It's all uh, it's all contract labor from somebody else. Gotcha. In other words, all the entertainment comes through another entity, and I I uh, I went through Scorman, Ted Ted Scorman. Did you have to try out for something like that, or is uh, it something no, that he, they just he'd heard me, he knew me, he gotcha. You know, and he just said, "You, you want to play?" I said, "Yeah, I do." So he put me down there, you know. Awesome, and I he put me a couple of other places like uh, down at uh, there's a place, uh, Crystal River. There's a couple of bars down there that he put me down there that I really liked. You know, the hard part, the hard part with me is everybody like in Ocean Springs. They want coffee house. Mm-hmm. I played coffee house for years. I, I just didn't want to play coffee house anymore. Yeah. You know, while you sit down there and play guitar and entertain yourself and, and just play, you know, and, you know, that's what Ocean Springs likes. But, but the tracks of sounding like a whole band, they're not interested. And it's, it's tough uh, sometimes. Uh, but like the yacht clubs, they love me because I'm a dance band. I play dance music. Mm-hmm. I want them to dance, you know, so. When I get them on the floor, I keep them on the floor. There you go. Now, do you prefer being, so when you said the coffee house, I'm trying to wrap my brain around it, do you prefer singing while there's like an atmosphere and people are talking or would you, do you, do you like being like glory bound? There's a show. What do you prefer as, a, as an artist? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Uh, I, I, I like it. I, I like, uh, I mean, I could turn it down so low that I could play in this room, you know, mm-hmm. and it would sound great. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I sound like a, a stereo and I get these old women they come up to me they'll go he really is singing. yeah they're watching they're watching your lips <laughs> sometimes you have to I've I've done that before like I'll sing I'm singing like a Sinatra tune or whatever and then I'll have somebody come up to me and say something and I've learned on purpose to pause and say hey thank you or or just stop because sometimes they're, che- they're a lot of people are watching and checking is he lip is he lip singing because you study that music so uh-huh. much and when you sing it over a thousand times you start sounding like that exactly and uh exactly. and a lot of people are impressed by that so I, I know exactly what you're talking about and back to the volume level thing a lot of people ask me my pet peeve actually not a lot of people my wife she's like what's your pet peeve and my pet peeve is when somebody now if they don't have a choice like let's say we're at a restaurant they don't have a choice they have to sit there i totally respect i'm gonna turn it down because they've my goal is to make sure that anybody close to me can talk if somebody's in the back and I have to turn load way low to where they can't hear it, that's okay. As long as these people are not going to sit there and I'm blaring them out because nobody wants that. But when it's like there's places to sit and they choose to sit in front of me, like, hey, man, can you turn down just a little bit? 
to me, I just want to be like, why don't you go back to the, the you know, the back side of the room, and why, oh, why like, would you sit right in front of me, and then say, hey, you know, can you turn down just a tad bit? No, move. You know, <laughs> I yeah, always but you that can't was, do that. <laughs> I know you can't. I'm like, oh, sure, no problem. Like, that's I'm saying what my brain cells are telling me in that uh, moment. No. But like, you know, I have before turned uh, turned the music down low, turned the microphone off, and just sing without the microphone. Well, you you have a. I mean, I've, I've heard you acapella man it's powerful do you have you ever did you ever read music or did you never learn to read music? It's amazing that's amazing now what like like when i go to church and i read the song book i can i can see the uh, uh you know the hold out you know so i read enough to to get me in trouble you know <laughs> but as far as read music no i can tell you it's all chinese to me yeah i just never understood it and i've had several good friends of mine try to teach me but i just you know I need to practice more. Uh, I used to be a pretty good guitar player, and then I started playing with those tracks, and some of the tracks had guitar on them, so I just play around what's on there. You yeah, know? you'd play like you would let the it's, rhythm do the thing. It's and... made me a better musician, but it, it's, it's made my guitar playing suffer. Mm -hmm. What would you give, like, what's, what are some words of encouragement or advice? There's a lot of young musicians. I don't know if you watched it. There was a guy named WOX recently, a couple of days ago I saw it. And his name was Six String Andrew or something like that. Young kid, 16 years old. And he was out there playing a guitar, playing blues. Uh, I even thought of you. And I was like, what would you tell them? Give them some advice. Like, like, or if, if, even if you look back at yourself back in the day and you, ha and you had to tell yourself something, what would you, some words of encouragement, some advice, just something to kind of, for people to take with them. I would say get with some other people and learn while they're learning just get with some other people. Learn what they know. Just pick up anything you can from somebody else hmm. and keep going. Just just get interested in it and do it. Uh, now there's so many mediums. You know, my grandbaby, she's eight. She was watching a YouTube thing where this young girl was teaching guitar lessons. So I get my Ed Sheeran Martin, which is a little tiny, you know, guitar, and I hand it to her, tune it up for it. And she's sitting there watching that, and they teach her three chords, G, C, and D. And she's going, G, C, D. And I can't get over how easy it is for her to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's watching that girl intently, and, and she learns the chords. So I made a mistake. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, if you'll learn a little more of that, because she sings pretty good. I said, if you'll learn like you are my sunshine, that's those three chords that you're playing. I give you a hundred bucks. If you'll learn that song, she picked, she put it down. She never picked it up again. <laughs> never picked it up again. Really? Nope. Wow. So I don't know if she was scared of it. She didn't want to do it. I don't How old know. is she? She's, you said she's eight. She's eight. She just turned nine yesterday. Well, it's her 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 hobbies and her you know things that she likes will be jumping around but usually around i know it happened for me around 12 or 13 or 12 or 13 i disappeared i, I locked myself away for about a year and i learned the guitar and my my dad always wanted me to learn the guitar and i was like i don't want to do that i want to just sing because i like to sing and i took one of his guitars 1976 fender um acoustic it was like his graduation present i dented it up like a, a dummy but I mean, i'm sitting there playing and for about eight months to a year I had that guitar with me everywhere. Everywhere I went, that guitar with me. And then, and my dad listened, but I never was like confident to say, play anything. And finally I was like, hey, I want y'all to hear something. And I just started playing. And they were like, wow. And it, it, that's sometimes what it takes is just, you know, diving in to that instrument and that's all you do. And you study That's all it. you do. Because I went through, I went, when I was younger, I went through a lot of bullying because I was a heavier set kid. I was short and I was heavy set. And so no, that you're was fat. I yeah, was too. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I always tell oh. the dad, I was like, but dad, am I, am I, am I fat? He goes, no, you're just husky. No, uh, I was fat. Yeah, I was, I was, I was husky uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was husky squared. And plus, I had a southern accent, so that was even worse, <laughs> you know, a fat kid with a y'all, you know. Was it, But that was kind of my escape, that and building model cars. But, I mean, I, when I was playing the guitar, that was my escape, and I really enjoyed learning that. And I wish I would have brought it with me, like, on my gigs, but once I started singing Sinatra, it was like, it's not really you can't, you can't no play. you got to be a, a learned guitar to play sinatra yeah the that's like playing christmas music you got to be really good to play christmas music yeah christmas music has so many chord changes it's amazing 
and uh, my friend George, he said, if you want to get really good at doing those, play a guitar like that, just play Christmas songs. Yeah. It's amazing how many chord changes. <laughs> well, many- jazz, I think it's jazz chords are, my dad told me two of the hardest music to play is bluegrass and jazz. And, uh, I mean, it, it seems true because I've, I've never really, I can't, I, I haven't even like attempted to dive into that realm. I like rock. I like country playing wise. Um, and even blues. Cause I feel like I can, I, if I spend enough time and studied, I could do it. But jazz and it's just like a whole different world. It's a whole nother world. Yeah, it really is. I, I could listen to it for about five minutes and then it goes off into left field for me. Mm-hmm. I like the melodies. I like the, I like the ballads, mm-hmm. you know, cause that's what I sing, you know, what's, what's your favorite. If you, I always tell people, you don't know me, but Ray Charles is my favorite song to sing, to listen to. I just love it. And I'm going to throw that at you. Do you have a favorite song? Yeah. Uh, my favorite song is a Christmas song. Uh, please come home for Christmas. There you go. I, I, I do Santa Claus like at the, uh, at the bow for the, uh, employee party. And, uh, some a lot of people there know that I sing, so they come over and they say, "Would you sing a song for Santa Claus?" They had karaoke there, so I got up and I sang, "Please come home for Christmas," and of course it's some something like that. I I try to nail it, you know. And I had everybody in the whole thing. It was probably three or four hundred of them on their feet. Boy, there, yeah, that was that's there. awesome. You know, Santa Claus is singing. <laughs> I mean, it's a cool thing because you yeah. you add that element to where. Well, that's why my daughter became a photographer. She wow. had a Santa Claus and a new baby. <laughs> now, the, I know your daughter, doesn't she sing? Oh, she's amazing. She sings with me for weddings and special events. I met her. She's like very that. sweet. And she's so smooth. Her voice is so pure. You know, I sing, I sing all the time, and I say I get all these, you know. <laughs> and she comes out there and just, just like lays it out there. They're so smooth. I really enjoy her singing, but. But she don't want to do it because I don't pay her enough. <laughs> <laughs> I pay her a hundred bucks. She wants to make two hundred. You know. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. <laughs> but uh, she started taking pictures, and now she's an avid photographer. Her uh, Samantha Anderson Photography. Samantha Anderson Photography. Remember uh, that, folks. Yeah, and she does. She takes. I bought her some really nice cameras, and uh, and she does. She does really good. We do the, uh, the Gulf Coast Carnival. She does Gulf Coast Carnival Association photos. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a tough thing being Santa Claus because some people can afford it. Some people can't afford it. And I, I have a flat base that I charge, you know, for, mm-hmm. for that. And, uh, and I hate it that, that I, I want to, you know, it's all, it's, it's, how I make my living. And now I've started in October doing beach photos. I wear a Hawaiian shirt. That's awesome. Red shorts, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. And I've started doing beach photos and I've got a couple of photographers now that are on the, on the bandwagon. And so now I do October and then November is the regular photographers. I have about 10 photographers that book me the entire month of November. And then after November 25th, after Thanksgiving, I go into full swing going to people's houses. And, of course, you see me. I go in and, uh, you know, I bring the gifts in in my bag and and show them, show them my reindeer. And, and we sing Rudolph and we sing Jingle Bells and sing Wish You a Merry Christmas and anything else anybody wants to sing. And then I tell them the night before Christmas from Santa Claus's point of view, which is kind of neat you know oh you do a great job and i you, th- you throw jokes in there and things to where you make sure the <laughs> even the parents can have some humor into uh-huh. it it's good yep, you yep. do an amazing it, job and it's really hard to go into a house and there's a eight month old that's the only kid in the house you know <laughs> and there's 14 <laughs> older people in there you know yeah. so i have to i have to entertain them now yeah so i have to change everything up you know mm-hmm. uh and uh it's uh when i when I was starting to do Santa, I would hire Santa Claus to come to our house for my kids. And they would come in and they would sit down and, uh, you know, you want to take some pictures? Yeah. Okay. Said, you know, I was kept waiting on to do something. They would never, never do anything. So, you know, being an entertainer to start with, it, it's, it's fun to go in and just take over a house. Yeah. You know, just go in and take over. You know? <laughs> it's, I'm telling you, if you haven't, 
if you have never witnessed it, be sure to, if you can, if you get on the books, hire or visit where, you know, the Gulf Coast Santa will be, uh, cause it's, it's a heck of an experience and I'm, I'm grateful. And you know what? Maybe next year when you go to, I think my sister booked you already. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Maybe I will do like, I'll actually capture it. I'll film it professionally and make it look good to where you can have that with you because I mean, you've probably done so many and I think people would really enjoy seeing that. And, um, I don't know. I just think it's a cool thing. And I definitely, we, we have, I've been doing something. I didn't do it this year cause my family wanted me to take a break. The past two years I've done this at home Christmas special. It started from COVID where nobody can get out. So you're at home. And I went through different places of the Gulf coast and I just filmed me and maybe some other people just singing songs we like. Very cool. Um, and we would record it and it's like a music video setting. And the second year it got bigger. We brought in a choir. We did more churches. It was really cool. So this next year we're wanting to do it. We're still planning it out, but I definitely want to hit you up on that to just maybe do, Very please, cool. please come home for Christmas. Who originally sang that song? Who was, it wasn't well, the Eagles. I do the Eagles version. Yeah. Yeah. I like the I Eagles. I like Bon Jovi's version. Punch a punch. Who does that? Yeah. Oh, I got to hear that. It's, it's got the hammer drum, you know, I like that. I like that heavy drum because it just seems more, it seems more like a band, gotcha. you know, and I really like the band and I had, I had a couple of good bands that, 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 that we played a lot and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really cool. I'll let, let, let me tell you a story. I was, I used to take a protractor. I would start at Gulfport and I'd spread that protractor out as far as it'd go. And I'd start over here and I'd make a circle all the way back to the ocean, from the ocean to the mm-hmm. ocean. Yeah. And every military base that was in that circle, I would book all the way around. Oh, that's okay. smart. So I'm I'm back in Biloxi. I'm back in Gulfport. Because Gulfport's pretty much my home. But I'm back in Gulfport and I'm down at the NCO Club one night. Me and Tom are sitting there talking. Tom did now. But uh, I'm sitting there talking to Tom, and uh, I said, Tom, you ain't got nothing for me I can't do. He goes, no, I ain't got nothing till till next month. This is like, this is like uh, I don't know, Tuesday or Wednesday night because they started on Wednesday, played, played to Saturday. He said, no, I ain't got nothing. And we're sitting there talking, and all of a sudden we hear this, Bam, crash, bam, all this screaming and yelling. We looked up on stage, and Mick Kelly had slapped Terry Ryan on stage. <laughs> they got into it. <laughs> the whole band was fighting. They were rolling drums and rolling right across the floor. And Tom looked at me just to sit, just to sit. Serious as he can be, says, well, it looks like we've got an opening tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I funny. I went there and played that next night. Oh, my played Lord. Played the rest of the week. Oh, it's funny. That's good now, stuff. I don't want to tell names on nobody, but, you know, Terry's still around. Terry's a great player. But you just you get some bands that pick up these people, you know, and mm-hmm. they just don't get along because one's playing too loud. Or mm-hmm. one's, you know, one's doing something that the other one don't want him to do. and. I mean, I, I always wanted a band because that's what I like. It's like when I, when my tracks would have an instrumental break, I would be like, I can't be like, all right, take it away, boys. Like, there's no boys there. So it's, it. And so I always struggle with that. But my dad kind of told me through his days, like, you know, do you really want to book a gig for a five piece and that drummer or that piano player or somebody's like, oh, I, I'm lost or I can't make it. And it's five minutes till showtime. Like, it's a lot of pressure. You're dealing with schedules. You're dealing with egos. And so. Yep. Um, he guided me in, the, in a way of that I could make it more of like a business versus, you know, a passion. Uh, I'm, I'm passionate about it, but more like a, a dream, I guess you can say. One of the things, one of the things that I learned over a period of years is, uh, everybody competes. The guitar player wants to be louder than the bass mm-hmm. player. The drummer wants to be louder than, you know, it's tough for the singer to be able to hear himself. You know, it, to sing over all that. By the end of the night, you're done. Yeah. You're done. You're, you're hoarse. When I went to Disney, they put me a country band, and it stopped right there. And I kept doing this all night. I was singing out the side of my mouth. <laughs> you know, I, I kept saying, my wife said, you got to quit doing that. You look terrible up there singing with that thing. 
Wait, so wait, why, why, why would you be singing out of your mouth? What was it? Because I was used to this. I was used uh, to I was used to a microphone with a with a windshield on it, you know. Oh, so they they gave you one of these ear things. Oh, they no, yeah, they went over my ear and stopped right there. Oh, and I, I kept thinking that I would get louder if I could sing <laughs> into it. Okay. So it's like one of those like church pastor yeah uh, yeah, yeah microphones yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah. So I told him I said I can't do this I can't do it. My wife keeps telling me I'm look look distorted <laughs> over because I'm singing outside of my mouth. And so he said, I got something for you. He said, they just they just designed and come out with a new microphone for Garth Brooks. He said, I'll, I'll bring it tomorrow. And said, you can try it, see if you like it. So he brought me a Crown CM311. Went over the ear, came around, came in front of my mouth. It had a little, had a little windscreen, and it sat right there. And I fell in love with it. Really? When I left, when I left down there, I begged him to sell me that microphone. He said, I can't sell it to you. So I immediately started buying them, and at that time they were two ninety nine a piece, and now they're five ninety nine a piece. Wow! And I've got probably half a dozen of them, and they're so delicate. I mean, if you just touch one wrong, it'll break. Mm. You can't drop it. You know, it was, it was designed for Garth to climb up into the attic and you know do all that <laughs> crap that he did. You know, and uh, and that's what I used, and that microphone. It's from 20 to 20K. It is the finest microphone I've ever used in my life. It is so crisp and so clear. People said, you know, I can understand every word you say. Well, that's because it's right there. And if I get, and I had to learn to re-sing all over. I was about to say, because you can't, if it's right there, you can't be like, you can't go, oh, like, you know, it's, it's, it's right there. It's right there. But now let me tell you what I do. If it's right there, I just kick my head up and put it down there and sing louder. And then I'll roll it back to my, when I'm singing lower. So I had to learn to sing all over again. But now, now when I sing, I can sing, I can sing forever. I never get hoarse. I still have a voice when I finish because I had to learn to sing all over again. Is there anything else before we wrap up that you would like to people to know? No, I, I, uh, I, I've been married 46 years. I have three children, 41, 38, 36. And uh, my son, 36, he's got two children, eight and five, and they live in North Liberty, Iowa. Oh, wow. I just I got to see them Thanksgiving. I was really excited. My middle daughter, she doesn't have any children, not married. She don't want to be. And my oldest daughter, she has my two grandbabies, and they live right around the corner. So we take care of the three-year-old, almost three. She'll be three in June. Wow. We take care of her. And we, the eight-year-old gets off the bus at our house every day. And they stay with us until mom and, or daddy comes and gets them in the afternoon. Let me ask you this, because this is my way of, I mean, starting to think this way, but I want you, I want to hear it from you. So you did the star search. You did the, you know. You could be a star. Be, be, be a star, Disney, Pitch and Forge, all that stuff. You were, you're chasing, you're, you're going for that dream. You know, you know that you sing, you love music, you're going for that dream. But actually, what I was doing was chasing that work. You were chasing the work. Okay, that's all it was. It was work. It wasn't a dream. Gotcha. Because I'd had my dream. I'd had my children. See, well, that's what I was getting to. I was getting to the point of, as when I was younger, starting this man, I was American Idol. I was I was chasing it, and then got married, had kids, and I realized, man, I get, and especially down here, because of where the way it's set up, and it's very it's slower pace. It's not big city. I mean, I felt like I made it. Like I almost like to where when you're when you're trying to make it. And I've had a lot of people. Why don't you go to Vegas? Why don't you go to this stuff? In my opinion, it's like that would not be a better life uh-huh. at all versus what we have down here. Exactly. And so I've been. I'm, I've trained. I'm now. I'm trying to think of the way of like I have made it. I am living that dream of being able to sing and then go home to my wife and my babies the same night. I'm not on tour and all that stuff. And so it's it's a really good way. It's a healthy way of thinking too. Um, because I'll meet some people and they, you know, resent the choices they've made because they could have, you know, lived this life. And I'm just like, where, where, where you're at, especially, especially down here. Cause that it's a virtual elevator. It is. You yeah. get on this elevator, you're going to go one way. You get on this elevator, exactly. you're going to go another. I know what you're saying, but, uh, but uh, I'll never forget. We were living in my bus at Pigeon Forge and Samantha was two and she'd been playing with the kids outside. She come in, she said, daddy, when are we going to get a house? 
and I thought about that and thought about that and thought about that. I mean, it just bothered me, you know, that she would think that. She would ask me that. So when we came back to Biloxi, I sold that bus and bought that house that I lived in there on the beach. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, sure did. And uh, it, uh, I'm, it's the best thing I ever did. Kids will change you. Kids will, kids will change you for the, for the better. They did. They'll test you. And I was so excited about my first. I was 28. I was so excited about my first baby. I just wanted that baby so bad, and I did everything I could do for that child. And then the second one came along, and, and they were – it wasn't quite as exciting as the first one was. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I, I, really, uh, I really love my baby so much. And they taught me – they taught me about children. And then they had their children, and the grandchildren taught me more about children. <laughs> you know, you find me a lot of times. I go to somebody's house, I say, come see Paw Paw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I love, I love children, and I love the fact that they're so innocent. Children are so innocent. It's moms and dads that corrupt the children. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily society, but that's a part of it. Mm-hmm. But over the period of years, I've seen that moms and dads just really don't want to be bothered mm-hmm. with it. They, you know, let them do what they want to do. You know, as long as they're not destroying nothing, let them go. You know, uh, it hurt. It hurts me to go into a house and you got five kids and four of them are on iPads and they're not paying any attention to anything I'm saying. Yeah, I see that a lot. And, uh, I'll see it at gigs too, where, you know, there'll be, you know, a family of four or five and all kids have pads. Now I'm not going to lie. We've, we've, we have my wife, my daughter has a pad, but we try to make sure that, and what Stephanie and I, we've started doing this when we get home from work, we put our phones on the charger for two hours and we stay away from it. And I actually have conversations with my daughter and I'll learn things. I'm like, wow, she knows this. She knows that. Like she's, all she needs is just that one-on-one attention. And you'll learn something, and she'll pick up something from you, and she's learning. So it's, you know, Silicon Valley, they won't let their children. Yeah. Have iPads for cell phones. They won't let them do any of that. Isn't that crazy? It, it, there's a reason for that. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's it's really a shame. Uh, we're, uh, there's a lot of things going on. That thing with the EU, oh, man. We're in for a, a big mess. What's going on with the EU? They're voting on the cities of tomorrow, what their their plans are. You know, Bill Gates has bought. Oh, yeah, the farmland. 400,000 acres of land. And then what they're going to do is they're going to put everybody on rations. You're only going to be able to have so much of this, so much of that. I mean, it's coming. It's mm. coming. They've gotten their foot in the door. And, you know, my daughter, she's the worst. Oh, Dad, I don't believe that. You're just, you're just paranoid. You know. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna see it. Yeah. You know, but, but my grandchildren will. And uh, people better wake up. <laughs> I agree. I agree completely. I feel like we're we're so distracted with all the things in our lives that you know there's, there are certain things that are happening that we. And you walk into a restaurant now, and everybody in the restaurant's on their phone. Mm-hmm. They they don't know what's going on around them. It's become a uh, it's zombified us, I guess you could say. Eddie, is there anything else you want to add? No, sir. Thank you for having me. Today. Thank you for having for coming. And uh, we're at the sixteen hundred studios inside of the Mary C Building in Ocean Springs. Hey, everybody, I'm Jesse Hill, and I'm Eddie McDaniel. And thank you, Eddie, for coming. And uh, stay tuned for next week. Thank you, Jesse. I'll take care. <laughs>